and the the ultimate uh, in, in we're not going to have we're not going to write the programs because they're very very complicated. What we'll do in this class and the main goal of this class, of course, is to learn how to wire a PLC, wire wire automated circuit, and also uh, to actually convert the program. So we're going to take the programs, and you'll learn a lot about that. that we're going to convert the programs that's already written for us. We're going to convert them from one PLC over to another PLC. So we're not going to come up with how to control that, even though we might play around with just controlling little sections of the line while we're trying to learn it. You know, and, and verify our wiring also uh, for the PLC. And then uh, convert it over and then compare it to the Allen Bradley PLCs. And what you're going to find out is uh, all your PLCs do the same thing, right? You understand that? And I, the analogy I like to use in robotics is just like you go out and buy a brand new car, you know they all do what? They do the same thing. But now you got to figure out how to run the radio, how to program the radio, how to do what? Uh, turn on your windshield wipers, which gets me in my wife's van all the time. I get in the van and it starts raining and I say, hopefully she's with me. I say, how do you turn on the windshield wiper? But I forget every time. But, uh, so what's so different to have the rally? They're not, they're, they they program different, and, and it's a newer model. So what we do, uh, we teach RS Logic 500, which is has been around for years. That's what we teach, because that's what our PLCs run, and we don't have the money to go to the new Compact Logics. Uh, but, so Compact Logics and the new Siemens use a lot of the same technology. So even though, uh, in a, but a lot of the stuff, is the same, but they call it different. It's really, it's really weird. So, back in the intro to PLCs, and you probably didn't do this in intro to PLCs, but what we moved into in advanced PLCs is using what we call symbols, right? So what we do is we come up and we assign, we assign a name to a device, and then from then on, instead of me having to remember all these addresses, I just type in the name. Uh, so when we come up here, let, let's get through this first. Uh, so wait, we're going to deal with tags a lot in this, sem uh, this semester. In, in RS Logic 5, 500, they call them symbols. And what you would do is you would, you would, you would assign a port, uh, you will assign one of your contacts or your ports or your internal coils a name, and then from then after that, you don't have to remember what. You don't have to remember addresses. You just start typing in the name, and it'll pop the address up there for you. Uh, in fact, uh, on this one, you start typing the name, <laughs> and it'll pop up with every symbol that ha that even starts out with that. So usually, you don't even have to type the whole name. All you got to do is just start it, and then do what? Uh, then you can select it from the list, and it'll automatically assign it to your internal coils. It'll assign it to your inputs and outputs. And it's a lot easier to deal with names than it is to try to remember what input you use for this, right, or what output you use for that. Especially when you get into very, very complicated uh, diagrams. So here, uh, of course, I had to add extra symbols to control the, the PLC, uh, but on the just adopting the uh, the uh, distribution line, which is the first one over that, I had a that was. Uh, 106 symbols in that. And what's nice is we'll use the exact same symbols that they used in, uh, we're going to use the same symbol names in, uh, in that they used on the Festo line. So what we'll do right off the bat is we'll set up our symbols. And then when we do our diagrams, we'll just start doing one. Type in the symbol name, you know, or the, they don't call them symbols anymore, they call them tags, which makes more sense. Well, one PLC per slot, but we're going to move to the Festo line, which is the, the one on the right. The, originally, when we bought the Festo line, uh, we specify, you could specify the PLC, and we specified an Allen Bradley PLC because there was no Siemens PLCs even close to us around there. And Allen Bradley is still the predominant PLC in the United States. 
But what's happened since Mercedes has moved into our our service area, it's a German company. Well, just about all these tier one manufacturers come in, they're what? German companies. And what what's their predominant PLC in Germany? Siemens. So we're getting an influx of Siemens PLCs into our area, right? So that means if you go to work like for Broza, which is uh, we have an intern program, uh, they're going to use Siemens PLC. Uh, Flexingate still uses Allen Bradley's because they're not a German company. And Gas Tump, I don't know what they use. Those are the main manufacturers, uh, uh, tier ones that we have. Uh, when you know they're talking about building something out here, right? down the street from us here in Vesper that might up up to four thousand jobs. Uh, we don't know what they're gonna use, you know, but it that, don't know. Still the 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 scuttlebutt is gonna be Amazon. It's gonna be an Amazon distribution set. That's the that's the scuttlebutt. Uh, they're gonna start off with fifteen hundred jobs, but it could go up to four thousand. I mean it's gonna be right over here off off the uh, four lane over here, the power plant road over there. It's going to be right there. I mean, so that's going to be an influx coming in here. And so what you need to do in our area now is you need to be kind of versed in both of them. And we're going to give you a really good. Don't know. Don't know. You don't. You don't. You don't know. Uh, so they might. They might not. They might choose off brand PLCs. We don't know. But. Once you've learned how to adapt from one PLC, they all do the same thing, right? Uh, they all do the same thing, and we do. And even though there's there's three predominant languages, uh, the ladder 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 diagrams is still the predominant language in the PLC because there's more people out there to understand. But what's neat about the uh, the Siemens software is that you can actually write the program in ladder and then switch it over to another language and see what your program would look like in another language which is pretty neat. I just figured that out. Even more in this area. Well not special not specialized more diverse you're more diverse so you get out there and you go to a place that's got a seedings PLC and you say well all I know is Ireland Brown. Well see now you have an option of going to a place that does Siemens or Allen Bradley's or even another PLC. It's just like, it's just like, and I found this out, the, the original PLCs that I learned are not even out there anymore. I mean, they're not even here. We, we did a square D PLC. That was the first one that we used. It had a dedicated terminal. So when PLCs first came out, you didn't program them with a computer. They had a dedicated terminal. Uh, they just had a dumb terminal out there. And the processor had everything in it. I mean, it had all your compilers and, and inter translators and everything. And these terminals, they were huge things. You know, we were still using uh, CRTs instead of using these the LCD screens. You know, uh, these really thin things. And our computers themselves were huge, right? Uh, then we moved into uh, some of them actually had a little front panel, and you programmed them in, in Boolean. You know, hands and oars and knots and hand knots and all that kind of stuff, which is basically what function block programming is, but you do it with symbols instead of having to remember hands and oars and that kind of stuff. Uh, then we moved into uh, where we, uh, the actual CPU doesn't have the compiler, it doesn't have the compiler in it. Y'all know what a compiler is? So we don't write, uh, the only language so it's like me. I speak, I speak, I speak English. Well, when we went to Germany, well, Germany wasn't too bad. There was a lot of English speakers there. But we went to a lot of countries that was nobody that spoke English. So to communicate with those people, we had to have a what? Translator. Okay. So we had to have a translator. So that's what compilers do. So, uh, the only language, the only language a computer understands is a language we call machine language. Some people call it object code. This is a binary language where you have an instruction is made up of an operational code, which is a binary code that says what the instruction is going to do. And then you have information that says how to locate your operands, the number you're going to deal with. So you had all these charts and all this stuff. Uh, 
when we first came into here, uh, the old IBM 360 computer had a bunch of switches on the front of it, and that's the way you could enter programs. You'd put ones and zeros up there, and you'd hit a button, and it would store that in, into the program. So what you had to do is you had to know the binary code to tell that computer what to do. How many people use machine language programs now? Nobody, hardly. They use a high level language, like ladder. So I come up here and I write my program in ladder. My PLC has no idea what ladder is. So what do we have to do? We have to translate. Uh, the, the program that completely translates it is what we call a compiler. It's a machine language program that's running. So when you install RS Logix 500, it installs the compiler. So when you say download, what does it do? It compiles it and downloads it into the language that that PLC understands. So that's why the first thing you do when you create a program is you identify the CPU because every CPU might speak a different what? Language. So that's what you're doing. That's why you have to do that. Uh, it's just like on your iPhone. So I can't, I can't install an Android operating system on my iPhone because it uses a different machine language, right? It speaks a different language, uh, which is which is pretty neat. But if I have a compiler, I can compile it over to an Android phone, or I can compile it over to a lot. So that's why you you have a lot of the same games and stuff for Androids that you do for what. For iPhones. Well, how do they do that? Well, they just use a different compiler. They just translate it differently. They write their program in the in a language and they compile it over to the processor. This uh, then we have interpreters. Interpreters, uh, they 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 compile on the fly. So that means when you put your PLC on monitor. You're looking at your ladder diagram, which is a high-level language, and you're you're monitoring a machine language language where you're doing that through a translator. So your your ladder diagram is not actually being compiled over; it's actually translated what on the fly. So we have two types of interpreters: we have compilers, and we have we have translators. We have interpreters. An interpreter does it does not create a machine language program; it does it what on the fly, right? You understand? A compiler does what. Translates it completely, and so that's what we're doing when we download, uh, download or we upload. So when we upload from your PLC, what's your compiler do? It's it's taking a binary program and translating it into a ladder diagram for you to watch, so you can see. So there you go. So now y'all know, and I don't know how we got off on that. So once you learn a basic language, uh, uh, once you learn how to program in ladder, ladder's a, a, a universal language, right? All you got to do now is just understand how they do it on that PLC, right? How do they do compares? How do they do internal calls? How do they do inputs? How do they how do they address inputs? How do they address outputs, right? And uh, of course, and, and so the Siemens, the way they address inputs and the way they address outputs is different than the way they in Allen Bradley does. But all you got to do is, is say, well, what's what's the what? What's the difference, right? That makes sense. And then once you get into the flow of that, so now how many different cars can you drive? How long does it take you to learn how to drive a car, a new car? Not long. I mean, driving's the same, but just just the little stuff, right? Because you know that all of them do what? The same thing. You know, how you turn the air conditioner on? How you turn it off? You know? How do you move it around? You know? And once you figure out that, you're you're just as comfortable in this car as you're what? Uh, in that car. So uh, the class meeting dates is a little different too. Uh, so what we do is we. And uh, unfortunately, they put they put an end date on the schedule, and we don't like them to do that. So what we do is you, the summer term is a ten week term. So we've got in many terms are five week terms in the summer. We can't do many terms with our classes because our classes are basically five contact hour classes over eight weeks. So if we tried to do it in many term, we would have to meet them seven hours a day, two days a week. So we don't do many terms in the summer. 
or we got another option. We could spread, we could rearrange the class, redo all our schedules and everything and teach it over a 10 week term. We don't do that either. So what we do is we just teach our eight week term, normal eight week term classes. That's the way they're already set up. So what happens is it, it gives us two weeks, and, but we're scheduled for 10 weeks. But so what it does, it, it gives us 10 week, two weeks that we can work with. And it gives us advantages to do things. Uh, sometimes we sometimes we do uh, 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 camps. We do technology camps. We haven't done it for like three years because other things have come up. But what's come up this semester is uh, we are we are certified to do the MSCC safety certification, so we can do that. Uh, there's actually four certifications that's available. Uh, what we're going to do in uh, we're going to get certified to do the other ones. We've already got it scheduled, so let me bring up the. Uh, no, as far as I know, the MSCC and the MT3 are permanent certification. Because once you learn how to use a meter, I mean, what can they do on the meter? It's just like meters, you know, meters. Uh, to be a digital multimeter, what does that mean? They can be, to be a digital meter to be classified as a multimeter. You got to you got to do at least two meters, but just about all of them do have about three meters in there. What's the three meters? Volts, amps, and ohms. Okay, so that would be like a car. So and I, I keep using that. So a car's got to be it's got to have a battery and a motor and a you know and a frame and a and wheels, right? And a way to turn it on and a way to turn it off. It's got to have C. But then they start doing what with the car? They start putting all these options in there, right? You understand? So, uh, what am I talking about? Yeah, so uh, meter, meters, uh, once you learn to do that, uh, then what varies between multimeters, uh, digital multimeters, is the options they put in there. What options do they give? Some of them gives you frequency counters. Some of them gives you logic functions. Some of them gives you this. Some of them gives you temperature. Some of them gives you that. Uh, so once you learn how to use one meter, then what you're concerned with is the options, right? You understand? It's just like in a car. Once you learn how to drive a car, you get it. You go out buying your car. What are you looking for? You're looking for options. Then you buy those options. You got to figure out how to use them, and that's the same thing true. So there's no reason to. Uh, uh, meters are pretty basic along. Yeah, and that's what the meter serves. So the meter certification teaches the the uh, the snap-on meter, uh, but it's got a lot of neat features on, it. Uh, like uh, yeah, it's got there in the car, in the toolbox, yeah. And that that would be the meters that y'all are certified on. It's actually a Seaman certification. So what NSCC three, what NS uh, National Centers for Certification National certification. I forgot it. I was probably. Uh, it. Uh, what they do is they have a sponsor for certification, and so basically you deal with their equipment, and it's a win-win situation. So for us to get for us to do the certification, we had to get that. We had to buy that car over there. Okay, and then it's sponsored by Siemens, so you get certified on a Siemens meter, not Siemens Snap-on meter. But it's just a meter, right? You understand? Uh, so it's called a meter certification. So it don't really say when you get the certification and you get the big award out there. It don't say. I think it does say snap on, but it just it's, it says meter certification and it has snap on because that's who it does who does what sponsors it. Uh, so once you get that, there's really no need to. To have a time limit on it because it just says that I know how to use one, a meter. MSCC is a, is basically a production. It, it deals with safety and safety is safety, right? Uh, production, different types of mechanics. Uh, well, the problem is right now is we're only certified to do the safety. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to take one of those weeks and we're going to get certified to do the whole a gamut of uh, MSCC certification. 
So what y'all gonna do is gonna give y'all a break. Let me give y'all a calendar. All hours are on late returns. Yeah, we record. We don't record tests when we go over tests for obvious reasons. These are posted on YouTube, by the way. Uh, so you can go up and you can uh, just search for my name, Rich Raymond, and then just subscribe to it. And you'll see all the lectures for all the classes, which is... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and uh, <coughs> I'm looking at the course calendar. So it's already set out, uh, set up for returns. Yeah, this week and next week we only have one day. <coughs> no, no. Yeah, we, so uh, what day. is what we do is that we say it's an eight-week term, but it's actually sixteen classes. So if you have a holiday, it shifts one more day into that. So a uh, 10 week term has so many classes in it. Uh, so what we do is we have 16 classes. Uh, so what I did is, uh, but what I wanted to show y'all is this week right here, you're going to have all from this class. We're going to have what? You're going to have a break in the middle of the term. And why is that <coughs> we're not going to be all so what we've done is we shifted our eight-week term one more week. So instead of ending according to your schedule, which they weren't supposed to put that in because we do this every term, uh, you're going to have a week off in the center. And it's going to be the 18th to the 22nd. And what I'm going to be doing in that time is I'm going to, be, I'm going to get my certification to do all the MSCC certification. Huh? Set the class too. I'll be I'll be in classes I'll be in classes during that time and uh, Hoyt's going to be in and Nancy's going to be in and of course Brittany's not teaching during the summer so she's just out of luck so we're going to be we're going to be going through what they call a blitz section of training where we're going to get the three certifications and that way instructor certifications so we can do the certification so y'all can so so y'all start off with the uh if you're taking the uh, the AUT 199 class, you'll start off with the meter certification, which we're already certified to do. And then uh, if we get through with that, then you'll do the safety certification. And then then you'll get the break off. And then after that, we'll be able to get, we'll be able to offer the other three certifications on MSCC. Right, now that is a that cost. I think it's like fifty dollars per certification but the state has granted that now so right now for you it, it is free so it'll be free for you and then uh, the nc3 the nc3 certifications we are a certified center so we pay dues every year for that so that means any nc3 certification that we can qualify for you y'all can get those free too uh, the semen certifications those are those costs and also the ETA certifications cost, and they're about 150 bucks per certification. Uh, so what's going to be nice about this first course is that you'll get uh, you'll get uh, three certifications out of that. Actually, MSCC is, uh, is is four certifications, but they they hold it under a uh, a, uh, a uh, an umbrella called CPT, which is Certified Practitioner Technician. Uh, you'll be a, a CPT certified uh, person, which is MSCC, which is really being pushed by the state. Right now. So the state is trying to bring this in, and they've actually granted uh, the colleges that wants to wants to do this. So you'll be able to get uh, six certifications out of that one class if y'all can take that. Are we okay? So this is our schedule, so we'll come back, and then, uh, unfortunately, it means we'll have our midterm when we come back. Now, our midterm is, is predominantly going to be uh, some information that we do in this class, but a lot of it's just going to be terminology classes. So we'll, we need to we need to really get into the terminology of PLCs, right? You understand? And there's a lot of terminology or language of the PLCs because you're not only dealing with what, you're dealing with PLCs. You're also dealing with computers. 
and you're also dealing with network. So, and also electrical, we forgot about that. So, you know, it's a, it's a big deal. Uh, so Monday's a holiday, and that's Memorial Day. And then uh, this is July the 4th, that's a holiday. And so what we'll be doing is that we'll be having our final exam right here on the 30th. Yes, yeah, on Wednesday. Okay, finals on thirty. Okay. So what we done? What we've done is we've extended it a week and uh, another week into that that two weeks that we have left. But what? It, and like I told you, the reason for that is. So we're not going to be able to do our technology camps again this year. So it, uh, the the uh, the syllabus brief also shows you what else it shows. Uh, first week courses and information, and then the syllabus and the brief, which is the same document. It's just that we break it into two. So this is wrong. I need to redo that. So y'all need to. Uh, so when's it going to end, though? Thirty. 30 yeah. That's what I was trying to do in here, but I kept getting phone calls. And this is my contact information, Mr. Sanders' contact information, which is our alternate contact. Uh, like I said, we're not going to be using this book much except when we get into trying to network these things together. There's a really good chapter in there on network. Uh, everybody okay on the first week quizzes and agreements? You know, that's the same. All our classes run that way. Uh, the Blackboard is already, Blackboard's still under development, by the way. Uh, and then your email, everybody's got their college email. I know how to do that, right? Uh, then remind, you know, I don't know about the remind application. That's a really, we talked about that at the faculty meeting this time. And you'd be surprised how many instructors really pounced on that uh, because it's a neat application. They did work out so well when I, when I had the students in my class join. It's really, really strange. Is that, uh, so on the syllabus quiz, uh, it's not really part of the syllabus, but the second, question on the syllabus quiz is going to ask you if, I, if it's okay if we send you text, 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 using, using your, uh, using the phone number that you provide. Uh, what I tried to do last term was have you sign up for it. I think in PLCs we had, uh, what, 11 people in that class and we had three people sign up for it. But every one of them on the syllabus quiz said it was okay if I if I used that number to send text. So I'm gonna go back to uh, what I did before. So I've taken that off. Or uh, if you tell them it's okay, I'll set I'll set it up in Remind for you. You know, Remind uh, that probably we weren't using that when you was here, right? Yeah, but you did Well, then then it was it was yeah. 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 Yeah, but you still have to do it for every class. So, uh, but it'll be pretty easy for y'all because I'll, I can, I can copy it from. So what I've done, and I didn't know if it was going to make any, uh, I didn't know if it was going to make, it was confusing, by the way, when I started thinking about it, is on Remind, what I've done is I've set up a dummy class called All.100. And what I do at the end of the term, instead of deleting all the people out of that, because I got to put a new class in there, right? Is I just copy everybody into that, into that class. And then that way, what I can do now is I can go back and send you a text, even though you're not taking one of my classes. Or I can do what? I can send stuff out to everybody that I've ever taught so far since we set them. So if you get a text from all dot 100, uh, I, so somebody called me and says, I didn't know I was registered for that class. <laughs> I got a text saying I joined that class and I'm not registered for it. It's not on my schedule. So uh, I sent that out.
Oh, boy. I just did it because I didn't want my students going through it. So what we're going to do, this we're going to have to do something. This class uh, goes. I also noticed, I noticed another uh, error in the in the brief. I think it says, on the brief it says the class, y'all's brief says it starts at 8 o'clock, right? Uh, yeah, you know it starts at what? 8.30. And it's going to go through what? July the 30th. So I think I've even got to go back and... Uh, no, I don't think the end date, I don't think the dates are on the actual syllabus quiz. So y'all make those corrections and I'll scrap these and give it to the other guys when they show up too. And of course the syllabus itself is pretty standard syllabus uh, that we uh, that we give out. As soon as I can get it. So uh, this is pretty standard syllabus, course description, uh, course the textbook. This is kind of, I should put optional down there, but we will be using it toward the end of the term. Uh, the post-it flags, you don't have to have that. Should I bring, should we bring our book every day? No, we won't even need it until the very end. No. Okay. Uh, internet access, Blackboard, y'all know it's very important to use Blackboard in these classes. Um, The competencies we're still working on, but this is basically what we're going to look at. Uh, the program that would have a lot. It's that, it's that, it is getting recorded. So this is some things we're going to make sure we look at. The program and application for for students is called the S7. They call it. And then they came out with a rider that goes on top of that that they call it the TIA portal, which is total integrated automation. And what they've done is uh, they've taken a lot of things that we used to do with all these different applications, and they put it together in one package. So usually to program the HMI panels, we had to have an application. Well, more and more manufacturers are going, you know what HMI is simple? Yeah. I've seen it on a different it's job. a human machine interface. interface yeah. So that's how you talk. Interface is the way you make a connection, right? To something. So HMI is a human machine interface. It's how you interface to a machine. Uh, so an HMI panel is a graphical panel. Y'all probably seen these. You know, most of our computer screens and everything now are touch screens. Uh, they're active touch screens. Well, used to to control manufacturing line processes and all that kind of stuff. We had all these push buttons and everything, but people now they're used to touch screens. So we've gone to just about every manufacturing program you see now. They'll have a big old screen up there, and people instead of actually pushing a button, they'll go up there and want to tap on the screen. Uh, so these are HMI panels. Uh, they've included that the programming of the HMI panel inside the TI application. Uh, they've included all different types of things inside of one package. So instead of you installing all this software on your computer now, you install one application that gives you the ability to set up the whole process, which is the communication, how to how to communicate, you know, how to assign uh, the actual logical addresses for the different devices. So we're going to be looking at the newest version of the software that uh, Siemens puts out uh, called the TF Portal. We're going to create it for the S7-1200 PLC, which is the version that we're going to be doing. Uh, originally, and what's so neat is uh, originally, uh, if you bought the if you bought the uh, Festo line now with Siemens PLCs, they use the 300 series PLCs. Uh, but that for education, they uh, they sell the 1200s. It's really neat for about $250, and you get everything. Per PLC, we realized that we could figure out how to do it with the 1200 PLC. So we're going to be using the 1200 PLCs, which is actually unique to Festo. They don't even use the Siemens 1200 PLCs either. 
Uh, we're going to learn how to mount it. Uh, mount it. We're going to learn how to electrically wire the thing. Uh, basically, PLCs all wire about exactly the same. So if you learn how to wire the Siemens PLCs, you'll learn how to, you, you can do the Allen Bradleys or just about any one of them out there. Uh, this uh, Skill Boss has a little generic PLC on it, but if you looked at the wiring diagrams for that PLC, it's going to be a lot. It's going to be basically the same as the Siemens and the Allen Bradley. Uh, of course, what we're going to also do is we're going to convert the RS-500 ladder, ladder diagram that are running currently uh, running on the uh, the uh, the 1500s, which we have back there, and we're going to convert them over to the Step Seven software. And this will be a, give you a good experience of what it would be required to go from one PLC to the next. Uh, it's just like uh, when they put uh, when they when they put Mercedes in, what PLC do you think they use down there? They use oh, Allen Bradley's, and why? Because they were coming into an American company, and they wanted to get people that already had qualifications, and the major PLC that we taught over here was what? Allen Bradley's. Well, what have they done now? They took all the Allen Bradley's out, and they've gone to what? Siemens, right? You understand? Because Siemens are more ingrained. When they put the first robots in there, they put they put uh, Fanix, because Fanix was the major robot manufacturer. Uh, well, they don't manufacture here. That was the major robots used in America. Uh, now they've moved over to KUKAs and ABBs. KUKAs and ABBs. Uh, uh, so they've changed over to what they're more familiar with in Germany than what we're familiar with here. Uh, so now what's happening is a lot of these companies coming back, they're not doing the transition. They're going directly to Siemens PLCs. Now. So in our in our service area, you're going to have a mismatch of different PLCs depending on where where you go to work at. So we'll look at how to do that, how to take a ladder diagram from one PLC. And they didn't rewrite when they went from uh, Allen Bradley PLCs to Siemens. They didn't start from scratch. They probably took what the, the, the programs they had for the Allen Bradley and just rewrote them for what the Siemens PLC. Uh, we're going to use some advanced timing functions. We played around with them a little bit in uh, advanced PLCs, where uh, intro to PLCs, or you learn how to set up timing for using uh, flip-flop timers, where you had one trigger the other, and you flip. Well, we don't usually do that because since we do a lot of timing applications, they have timing available inside the PLC, and we'll learn how to use some of those, which is pretty, uh, pretty, pretty neat. Some advanced time plot. Uh, we'll look at setting up ProfiNet, which is, uh, Alan Bradley calls it Ethernet IP. Uh, so ProfiNet is an open technology interface built around uh, the Ethernet standard. Y'all understand that standard? Ethernet? Not really. I mean, Ethernet is a way, so Ethernet is, is the electrical wiring, how we wire the network up. And then we have different uh, uh, protocol. What's a protocol? It's an agreed upon way of doing things. So if I'm going to send information a bunch over wires, then we got to have a agreed upon protocol where the guy that's receiving it understands the protocol that's being transmitted. So we have different protocols uh, that we use. And we were using all type of protocols for a while. But Ethernet is probably, and we had different ways we connected. And we still uh, we'll still run into that in the PLC, so we'll look at a little bit about that. Uh, the one that the way we connect the uh, we connect the uh, the Amatrol is connect using a uh, an industry standard called Profi Bus, and uh, you can probably see we got these purple wires and they're daisy chained down through each PLC. So we have one PLC feeding the next PLC feeding the jumping. Next PLC. So we'll look a little bit about that. Uh, what Ethernet uses, of course, we have Wi Fi, we have wireless Ethernet, and then we have wired Ethernet. And we're going to look at wired Ethernet. I don't think we'll have time uh, to actually build the cables, and we got plenty of cables anyway. And I'll show you all that and show you it's not, it's not that hard uh, to do that if uh, we have all the equipment to build our own cables here. Uh, did y'all learn cables in your, in your networking? Certification. Yeah. 
uh, we're going to use uh, so Profit ProfitNet is is uses the Ethernet interface, so we, we could actually do this wireless, and then it uses a, a transport protocol uh, called uh, TC trans trans it's called TCP/IP. I don't know if you have heard of that or trans transfer control inter, uh, uh, interface and, uh, and then uh, internet protocol interface. Uh, so TC, uh, TCP, uh, uh, TCPI is, is the protocol on how you put the information together. So when we send information over a network, we just don't send it. They put it in a frame that we call a packet. And so TCP identifies the makeup of the packet. How do you address it and how do you do this? And then IP is the method of addressing. And so we'll look at, and y'all probably heard of IP addresses. Have y'all heard of that? And we'll look at what makes those up, and uh, we'll look at uh, the different versions that we have. Uh, you know. So, if I'm going to send something over Profinet, then we're going to have to establish uh, these IP addresses for each each unit, and then each one of them will have to be well, that have to be different, right? You understand that? And we'll we'll look and see how we can do that. Yeah, even the so the, even the HMI panel will have to have an IP address, and that's the way we send. Information and we'll look at MAC addresses and that kind of stuff, and we'll play around with this. And we'll let y'all do some basic programming on these. Uh, you can do automation on these things. You can actually almost draw your plan out. Uh, and you can do all kinds of stuff. And we'll just look at setting up basic basic buttons and things like that. And then we'll look at we'll just look at setting up basic buttons and stuff and indicator lights and stuff like that on these things. And then uh, so we'll look at playing around with H and I. We'll probably do that. So what we'll do is we'll start off by. Uh, by, by converting the ladder length over. Now, of course, the uh, the, uh, the the uh, programs inside the Allen Bradley uh, does not support HMI, so we'll, we'll learn to do that. So, if you're going to put another set of push buttons out there, even though they're they're simulated, you're going to have to go into your into your main program and add those buttons in there, right? You understand? So if I've got a manual push button that says I'm going to hit this, it's going to start the function, and then I'm going to put an HMI simulated push button, then we're going to have to come up with some way to develop a contact and put those in parallel, right, and do an OR circuit. We'll, we'll show you how to come back and model. That was interesting for me uh, to figure out, to take the Allen Bradley PLC, the, the program that I got running, and then adapt it over so we could also run it with a log, with an HMI panel. So this is the stuff that we're going to be doing in this class. And uh, this is the way we're going to assess it. First, we'll quit. We'll probably bump these for next week. So we've got a lot of people that show up today. Uh, we're only going to have two tests. And what two tests we're going to have is the end term and the final. Uh, we've already got some assignments out there, guys. But these are going to increase during the term. So we, we, according to what I understand, we're going to have to add at least some type of research project into uh, one of our assignments. So we'll have to do at least one more time. And of course, the big thing on this class was labs. This is a predominantly a lab class. Uh, we'll have discussions. Uh, you're going to have to discuss things that you're doing. We'll we'll have a kind of like you would do at a plant. We'll start off with like group meetings and stuff like that, and you'll talk about what's going on with your project. Uh, we're, we've got uh, uh, eight people in the class. I think we'll have to go back and look. Uh, we got seven. We might have eight. Uh, if we do have eight, then what we'll do is we'll we're going to uh, that'll get, we're going to work in teams. So all we're going to have the ability to do uh, this semester is probably convert four of the four of the modules over. And then, uh, but each one of them is going to have different. A lot of them's the, a lot of them's the same as far as some of the things that we do. So if you think about the start stop button, you know, all those are the same on all modules. So that section of the program, when every one of them is going to be well, the same. Uh, then you get into the actual section that runs your module. That's where the, that's where the differences are going to start. And um, we'll have to look at those. So everybody's going to have a little, uh, every group is going to have little problems and we'll get together. Uh, that'll be something that we'll get together and just do while we'll have meetings. And uh, we'll talk about the problems that we're having. We'll try to resolve them uh, as a class. 
midterm exam and the final exam. And of course, we're only having two tests. So what does that mean, guys? Can't drop any of them. Right? Can't drop the lowest score. There's no lowest score drop here. And, uh, so that's why we're giving you your make up, no makeups, right? Everybody understand that. Uh, first week quizzes, laboratory is very, very important. Grade average. Of course, you got to make at least a watt to pass the class. See, at Lawson State, yeah. Uh, recorded lectures, like I said, we're recording this right now. And uh, I'll try to put the links. And unfortunately, guys, uh, to upload these things, it takes longer to upload them uh, than it does to record them. Because not only do you have to upload them to YouTube, then once they get up there, they have to compile them over to YouTube's format. You all understand that now, right? Uh, so it takes quite a while. Uh, so usually I only, I'm only able to do it once a week to upload them to, to Blackboard. They'll get uploaded to YouTube before there's a link in Blackboard. Everybody understand that? Uh, and like I said, if you want to uh, see the lectures, and there's like 400 and something up there. I need to go back and get rid of some of the real old ones. Uh, but uh, we, uh, you just go in and when you, you just go into the search tab on YouTube and just look for Rich Raymond, right? And then uh, you can subscribe to that channel if you want to and you have available to all the lectures. So you can go back and look at all kind of lectures up there. Uh, absences, you know, it's very, very important in a, in a mini term class to be here. Uh, we've had several people uh, that could have made a lot great, better grades. They just didn't do it because they were what uh, absent. I learned that when I was taking a college class. I missed one day and it cost me an A. Maybe that would be because the stuff they covered, they tested on it the next class. I didn't have idea what you're talking about. Uh, withdrawals. Uh, we have problems with this. People withdraw from the course. Y'all know I cannot withdraw y'all from the class, right? Everybody understand that. So if th something happens, you need to withdraw. Who has to do the withdrawal? You do, right? Go to uh, the Lawson State's website. Click on uh, Quick Links. I don't think it's on the first list, and so you, I think down at the bottom it says additional leaks, and you go there and there's a neat withdrawal process, so you can do this from anywhere. Uh, academic integrity, plagiarism, plagiarism, oh, plagiarism. 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 Yeah, trying to take credit for somebody else's work. Yeah. So, uh, and by the way, this is, this is from, uh, this is from the college, and they said we have to put that on there. And they said you're supposed to watch the integrity class on academic integrity. But guess what? There's no there ain't no, there's no integrity. I don't know where it's at. I need to find out. But uh, we we had to copy and paste this into our uh, into all our syllabi. Integrity was real neat, but it, it uh, so on integrity. If I would record it a lecture. And I, I turn my computer on, and it would be uploading it right now. It'd be doing it in the background, and it would it would pop up, and it was real neat because every time I change slide, it would put another link in the in a slide. So instead of watching the whole lecture, you could go in and say, "Well, I need to go back over this," and you just find the PowerPoint slide, and you click on it, it'd take you directly to it. Uh, if you went away from it, it came back. It would keep up with where you was at. But it cost the college like eighteen thousand dollars a year to license that, and they probably had three or four instructors using. So what did they do? Got rid of it and went to screencast fanatic which is really, really cheap to license it. You can uh, screencast matic You can download it yourself, and it's free. But it limits you to fifteen-minute lectures or fifteen-minute recordings. And it's real neat. You can capture your screen. So if you're watching a movie on your computer and you want to record it, you could do what? Just capture it. Yeah, yeah but like you said, the Huh? So we have a license, though, so we can we can make them any length we want to. Uh, professional decorum. Texting and using unauthorized internet use is not allowed. Please keep this class. This was funny too. We were, we were having our uh, 
professional development classes between uh, semesters, and uh, Dr. Crawford called an instructor out for sleeping <laughs> during our meeting. It was funny. Speaking out of turn, a really unsa uh, unkindly, unnecessary crash in the classroom. I don't know what you mean by that. Eating and drinking. Uh, we don't eat in this classroom as far as uh, bringing like a drink in here. I don't mind that, but nothing over there by the manufacturing line while we're in lab, right? Uh, but no eating in my classrooms. And that, to me, it bothers me. I mean, uh, uh, appropriate, of course, here. Uh, I needed to put that into, uh, we've got to wear appropriate, uh, and this will be in the lab procedures. I ain't gave those out yet, but uh, what are we going to wear in here? We're not going to wear any summertime. We're not going to wear any what? Shorts, right? No open toe shoes in this class, right? You understand that? Uh, short sleeve shirts are okay. In fact, in, in, when you're working around, when you're working around motion, it's okay, but when you work around high voltages, you we don't have any high voltages in here, so short sleeve shirts are okay, right? You understand that? Uh, if we work in motor controls, usually we don't allow that because you're working with high voltage electricity over there, right? So what does that have to do with this wavelength? What you mean? You said short sleeve high voltage don't work. No, yeah, you're supposed to wear long sleeve fire resistant. Uh, I, uh, we we're in what they call a category one environment over there. Oh, I'm sorry, we're in a category zero environment, uh, which which requires safety glasses. It also requires ear protection, but we don't need that because we're not in manufacturing. So you're supposed to wear long sleeve, in electrical, you're supposed to wear long sleeve, fire resistant shirts. You're not supposed to wear any polyether, polyester, any stuff that burns. And what you want to do is you want, you want to uh, take away a place where you can touch, right? You understand that. So if you got on a short sleeve shirt, then you're exposed all this right here to. Uh, so over in motor control, we work with 208 volts, uh, which you know. So we we want you to wear long sleeve shirts, right? You understand to wear. We want you to wear no open toe shoes, not even open toe shoes over here because you can drop stuff on them, right? Uh, they uh, in industry they would require you to wear leather shoes. Here we don't require that because we're only dealing with 24 votes in this class right here. Uh, so, uh, but in the industry, you'd have to wear at least leather shoes. You can't wear canvas shoes. You have to wear leather shoes. Uh, some companies require you to wear steel toe shoes. Uh, U.S. Steel required you to have metal tarsal, metal tarsal protect, uh, protection, which uh, protects the, uh, the part of your foot uh, between your uh, your toe, uh, your toe up, up to your ankle, up above your ankle, uh, you had to wear those too. Which got me into trouble a couple of times. Because you get you get out there in US Steel and you, you had something you wanted to drop down. I did it more than once. I let it drop down on, to get my hand out from under there, I let it drop down on my steel toe. And then I'd slide my steel toe out. Well, I got home one time and wanted to do something heavy and what I did. I put it on my toe, yeah. <laughs> Because I did it so many times out of USD. Uh, this is something they've also added. We got to make sure uh, that we look at. This is your course concerns. So what they've done is uh, there's been a process uh, a long time for people who have concerns about the course that they're taking. So what the, and it's been the procedure's been out there a long time, but they never had it where the student actually knew exactly what procedure they needed to have if they had problems with a course or had a problems with an instructor or stuff like that. So the first thing you're supposed to do is what? Yeah, you're supposed to put the records in the instructor. Y'all can resolve this matter, that's fine. If you don't resolve the matter, then the second person you're supposed to talk to is Uh, they may not be able to resolve the matter. If they don't resolve the matter, then what can you do? Then the third option you have is there is a link on it's inside course quick links on the website. It's 
besides the bigger portal, portal there should be a link that says confirm the compliance level. So what you're doing now is you're filing a, an official complaint with the college. And then it gets out of our hands and moves into administration. And then they would try to figure out what, what they need to do to resolve this matter. Are you okay on the procedure? So first number one is what? Me. Second is Nancy. Third, if it's not resolved by then, which would surprise me, but if it's not resolved by then, then you would actually file a complete official complaint. And that's the Lawson State website. Everybody okay there? Harassment, no harassment, disabilities. If you have a disability, uh, you need to contact either a, a disability that needs special consideration. Well, I'm not even going to say special. It needs some type of accommodation that we can put into place to have you successfully complete the program. And it has to be documented. So you can't approach an instructor and say, Rich, I need extra time to take the test. Or Rich, I need this. I cannot make special considerations, or, or not special, make accommodations for you that I don't make for the entire class, unless it's what? Unless it's documented. So once you go, you go and talk to Ms. Renee Herndon on this campus, and she would send me a letter and say, you know, that says we need to make these accommodations so this student can successfully complete the test. And they'll do everything they can. You know? They've had translators, they had people that you can sign language. Uh, we had one uh, student that uh, had a hearing problem and uh, he didn't like sign, he could do sign language, but and he could read lips, it was really neat, but he had a, he had a keyboard uh, monitor that we put in front of him and then he had another keyboard and they got a, a court sonographer to come in and literally type everything that the, that the instructor was saying. So not only did he have have it two way, but they they uh, they took uh, care of that for him too. Uh, cell phones and pagers, what you supposed to do in the class, or just put them in silent. Accessible use means uh, all this stuff over here don't belong to you. Uh, you need to take care of it right. Uh, discrimination and harassment, no, we don't discriminate against people in my classes. <laughs> Uh, children on campus, we don't allow children on campus. And then uh, the notes. There's a couple notes I just want to look at, and that's uh, you know, our classes are pretty much well structured. And, and, and what you find out in most of our classes, our classes are not, if you, if you do your work, you're going to pass the class, right? There's so many avenues you can go. Uh, the only people that I can think of that's actually failed my classes are the people that watch. Don't don't show up. They're absent all the time. They're partying and stuff like that. And then they won't talk to anybody. And then they come in at the end of the term saying, "What can I do to pass the course?" Yeah, <laughs> it's the last it's the last week. What do I need to do to pass the course? You know, well, I'd say, well, there's really nothing you can do because it's what. It's too, it's too late. Uh, but we can make accommodations if something happens. Uh, you know, even last semester, it was really neat at the PLT class. Uh, this, this was done by the people in the class. You know, CC and them actually set up sessions where they actually did, uh, you know, reviews for PLC. They did, uh, you know, work with that too, which is really neat. I really appreciate that too. Uh, for all of the ones that was involved. Uh, so another thing that uh, gets me is if you arrive late or leave early, you need to do what? You need to let me know. Everybody okay there? Everybody understand that? And if I'll have people do that all the time, I'll turn around and somebody will be gone. And they didn't say, you know, you know, you're an adult and you're responsible for being here or not being here. So really, I can't keep you here. Uh, if you need to go, I, and there's no excuse absences in college. Everybody understand that? So uh, you don't have to tell me why you're having to go. You need to just say, Rich, I need to go. So, like Anthony did a while ago. That was great. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I might discuss something with you and tell you what you're going to be missing, you know, and it's going to be hard to make up, but that's just me. You know, I know, I know 
you know, uh, what's going to happen. But really, if you need to go, all you need to do is just say, I need to go, you know. And then uh, you come in late. You know, I know everybody in this class. So when I do row, I'm not going to call row. What am I going to do? At the start of the class, I'm going to open it up. I'm going to count everybody here that's here. And everybody that's not here, I'm going to count them all. Absolutely. And then I'm through with row. And then Rich moves on. So what that means is if you come in late, you better make sure that I that you let me know to get you on row because I already forgot about it, right? Understand that? And that's about it for the syllabus. Y'all got any questions on the syllabus? No. So what we're going to do, we can't do very much uh, today. I, I think the syllabus is okay, but there are a couple of corrections that was made to the uh, to the to the syllabus brief, right? And that was the what? The start time and then the end time. The end date. Everybody okay? So let's go over and look and uh, stop the report.